All right. So once again, I welcome you to the to the course uh, financing new ventures in the global markets. And this course, uh, we primarily um, will be we will be studying. Actually, this course is a part of corporate finance course. So financing new ventures is a subset of corporate finance. So when you are studying financing new ventures, technically you are studying corporate finance. And there are three important things that we shall be studying in this course. Uh, what type of uh, long-term investments should be, should the business entity must undertake? Because the idea of financing and investing uh, is very interesting in the sense that we have a saying that like financing, like investing, the kind of financing you have would determine the kind of investments. I don't know if I said in some other course to you or not, but financing is basically uh, where money comes from and investing is where money goes to. So if you are a company, if you are a controller or if you are a treasurer or if you are a CFO or if you are a CEO of a small company and you're doing all type of things, including uh, financial activities also, then as a, as a corporate executive, your main job is to get the funding and then investing it and making sure that what you get from investing is more than the cost of financing so that you remain a profitable and sustainable business organization. Because you can have losses, but you can't have losses for the long term or for the secular time period, because eventually then the company will not be able to bear those losses because every loss is a erosion of your capital. When I say erosion of capital, uh, it may mean that if you have invested, if you got the funding, financing of 1 million, uh, let's say uh, 100,000 euros, and you are able to invest that financing of 100 million euros in the projects, in the assets, in the investments, that at the end of the period, you are able to produce 120,000 euros. So it means that you have create, created a new value by 20,000 euros. This 20,000 euros, it adds to the company's capital. But if imagine you are not having a profit gain, but rather you are losing, 20,000 is, is a loss. So basically your capital will decline by 20,000. And if it goes next year, again, 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 eventually, the company will no, lo no longer be sustainable to be continued. And that leads to the corporate bankruptcy and eventually insolvency. You see my point? So therefore, we say that like financing and like investing. Then the question is, do we have an ecosystem in which we make sure that our return on investment is more than the cost of financing. Because see, this question is very important. You get the money and then you use the money. So technically a firm is a, is a mediator between funding, financing and investing. So you are the corporate entities, they are the intermediaries or the go between the financing and investing. But there is a problem now. The problem is the timings. The timing in, is very important in finance. You never get funding every day. We never get millions of euros of financing every day. And we never make millions of euros investment every day. Then what do we do on daily basis? We operate. We work this nine to five thing, yeah? We operate. And what do we operate? We operate on our machinery. We check that there is no breakdown in the machinery. 
the maintenance is good. OK, we make sure that our laborers, our workers are giving the best of the talents to the organization. There's no loss of human resources. There's no loss of financial resources. Loss of financial resources. You could borrow money at 1%, but because of your slackness, you are you haven't used that exercise. You have got some wrong form of funding with high cost. Financial wastage. You also have a material wastage. How? Your product, your production is based on, you have a factory type of organization and you have raw material uh, inputs. Nobody's taking care of them. They're getting lost. They're getting depleted. They're getting, you know, wasted. So we make sure that you make the best use of resources, the optimum use of resources, and also you minimize the wastage and losses. And whose job is this? Controller's job is this. The designation of the job could vary. Uh, you can call them uh, internal controller. Uh, you can you can even call them some uh, how to say it some what could be the other names? Yeah, the many names, right? But usually we have the, the the person who is more responsible for this job are the internal controllers, internal auditors, treasurers in big companies, and even in the bigger companies like some kind of multinational global companies, we have this very important designation called uh, chief financial officer, CFO, who is sometimes even more important than the CEO. Because if CEO has to make a decision, he has to ask, do we have money to invest? Right? So therefore timing is very important. And when I'm saying this thing, timing, here I'm, I underline this thing, taking care of machinery, making sure that the workers, not everybody goes to lunch break same time, uh, when the machines are running, okay, no wastage, electricity saving, and all these things. So this will make sure, all these tiny mini things will make sure that the return on investing is more than the cost of financing. That's one thing, timing internal control system. But then there can also be some external eventualities. You can have a fantastic investing plan, financing plan, but suddenly uh, the geopolitical situation becomes very hostile. It's none of your fault, but it's an external threat which you have to live with it. Everything was great. You are going to invest some couple of millions of euros in R&D and then came COVID-19. So these type of externalities or these external contingencies can also come in your way to thwart, to, to, to block your, uh, you know. So you can be um, living in the unfortunate events. The corporate history is full of people, very mediocre kind of, very people who, who became very successful because they were in the good times. And corporate history is also full of those genius, those gems who disappeared from the scene because they were in the bad time. So timing is very important. And timing is not only coming from your internal uh, situations, but also they come from the external events as well. Hmm? Um, yeah. You can be a best company in the world. You marvelous people you have in your organization. Uh, the demand for the product is really huge. People are queuing up. You're getting the orders globally. And you choose to sell the products to ca Canadian company, Canadian buyers, right? And you agree that, hey, because we are having our, uh, you know, initial phase of our love affair. So you can pay me in Canadian dollars. And when the day of payment comes, the Canadian dollars value go down against euro nearly worthless, so you lose money. Was it your fault? <laughs> Did you have good, bad machinery? No. Did you have bad people in your, working in the company? No. But just because of some external risk, the company became bankrupt. So we also see that the investing and financing, and it's connected by the operations. I'm not sure if I ever said this thing to you. Maybe uh, these IB students have seen this picture before. But sometimes I tell my students that if somebody asks you uh, that 
can you define a firm without speaking a word? Then, then you can do this way. Uh, you can do this way. You can draw a picture, a lovely picture. You see, you'll see my drawing very often and you'll forget Picasso. Hmm? Is it a good drawing? What is this? Well, this is financing. Let me see if I could use a text here. This is called financing. And financing is what? Did I use a phrase something? Hmm? Money comes from. Money comes from. So financing is money comes from. Financing, money comes from. You are an entrepreneur and you are financed by investors, right? And who are your, what are the two broad category of your investors? Yeah. Sorry? No, 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 no. That, that's, that's, you're going in the, you're going in the portfolio. You're going to the wealth management. Hmm? I think you should find job in KPMG or in, uh, uh, or in Maryland Lynch. <laughs> uh, Yvonne, you're right, but not in this context, yeah? You're, you have two types of investors. The one category of investor is who want to give you money. You present your, you do pitching, you present your case, they agree with you, but they say, you know what? Um, I want to give you money on the promise that you would make a commitment with me that you would be re returning it to me on certain time period yeah and you will also pay me some fixed rate of interest or a flexible rate of interest depending upon the agreement so your investors those who give you money from from whom the money comes from the investors they are the first category I said, those people who say that we want to give you money, but uh, give us fixed rate of interest and make a commitment that you return the money also. So I give you 100 euros, uh, pay me 10% rate of interest. And after two years, uh, annual interest plus the 100 euros, give it back to me. Make sense? These are called debt holders. Debt investment, okay? The debt investors are those investors who want to finance you. They like you, they like your projects, they like your ideas, but they also want to keep an arm's length distance from you. If you win, they win. If you lose, you lose. <laughs> so your company can become an overnight uh, blockbuster in the corporate world or your company can fail, they don't care. The second category of people are more daring. They're more adventurous, more maverick, and they are called equity investors. Who are they? You know them? The shareholders, basically. We can call them just shareholders or equity shareholders or the equity investors. They are the people who are the real risk lovers. Right? So you make, when you get this money, you, you, and you, you invest the money, you take risk. Do you? But they people have also taken risk by giving money to you. If your company is a big success, they get big money. They get a lot of money from you. If your company fail, they also fail. So it's very contagious type of relationship. Mm -hmm. If you sneeze, they catch cold. If you do good, they get a lot of money from you because more profit, more, more investment, more money they get from the company. Right, And if the company is losing out, then they also lose. And you, there are so many cases when the stock prices have become, there are many companies whose stock prices became zero, if not negative. Yeah? 
if you look at any company in the world which has become bankrupt, like Enron, like Adelphia, or, or Lehman Brothers, um, then you will, one thing is common that, that their share price would be zero, worthless, nothing. They lose, the investors lose everything, basically. The shareholders lose everything. But there's more uh, financial, uh, Im, uh, you know, the immunity to the debt holders, the debt investors. In case company bankrupt, then in terms of debt investment, mm -hmm. the investor will get money from the debt investors. Um, very interesting question. My plan was to tell this uh, <laughs> this thing a bit later, but since you asked me, I will tell you now. We have a theory. The beauty of finance is that every theory has its direct and instant application. We have a theory in finance called pecking order. It's a theory, but we call it hypothesis. What do you mean by the word pecking? I never heard this word. Never heard? I'm sure you heard it. Yeah? Eggs. Mm -hmm. You're close, actually, you're not far away. Yeah. Uh, have you heard the woodpecker? About woodpecker? Have you seen this bird, woodpecker? Yeah. He's, he's pecking the wood. So the idea is that if a company is dead, who packs it first? It's a bad way of portraying the, the whole thing, but basically it means that when the company is in crisis or going to be bankrupt, you need to give some money back to the stakeholders, right? Uh, and in which order the company should be packed by each stakeholder. So you, uh, you get the idea of what packing order should be always. Uh, the government is the one which says that, hey, when the company is going to die, or uh, after all, when the company is in a crisis, the company is attached by some authorities, some official, and then they say, hey, now we will sell the assets of the company and whatever the proceeds come, we will give to the stakeholders. So the first stakeholder who is in the queue to get the money from this dead company, uh, the government is the one who packs first. The second uh, stakeholder in the packing order, generally, see, I'm not making a universal definition across the world. It also vary across the national regulatory system. But these are the general guidelines of packing order. The second one is uh, uh, the employees. Sometimes it's employees, but in more capitalistic countries, the banks are more in the, but I think usually it's employees who are number two. Well, the order can change. Number three are the, uh, basically, uh, the, the debt investors. And finally, uh, there may be some more stakeholders, which I don't remember, but finally, if I, if I do like this, I leave some space. The final stakeholder is who? The equity shareholder. The equity capital investors, or the commonly called as a shareholder. Usually number one, number two are fixed, but in between there can be some more stakeholders as I said, but one thing is certain that the shareholders are the last one in this packing order. And this is why we call them as residual claimant. What is resi residual? Leftover. Those who claim leftover. If something is left, imagine that the company is in crisis, they make a sale proceeds, 
uh, they pay some money to debt owners, employees, their pension, their salaries, the dues, their provident fund, the given, the government has got its money, which it gives in the form of uh, some grants uh, or, or tax, the, which you owe to the state. Uh, you also owe some, uh, some penalties or some other things which you are supposed to pay to the state. Okay, pay it now, some environmental uh, uh, taxes or whatever. Uh, okay, then comes employees, then something is still left, give to debt. Look, it could be possible when I say, that the debt owners, uh, they want to be safe, yeah? But see, it could be possible that all the money is exhausted here only. You see my point? And nothing is left for debt investors. So in practice, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in, in, in theory, it's possible that the debt investors also don't get anything. But then we also have an, another concept in finance or in accounting. We call it uh, perpetual succession. Look, I'm kind. What kind of word I'm giving to you? <laughs> it does look very bizarre word. Perpetual succession. We assume that the bankruptcies or insolvencies or di dissolution of companies are just exceptions. The companies go. Companies go. Companies continues. Maybe the company become uh, in a bad shape. Uh, maybe uh, somebody buys it, yeah, and then start restructuring and the things continue. Look, companies are not like something that there is a, a fire and they, it got burned. No, if the company is bankrupt in a very bad shape, it could be possible that in the restructuring, somebody else buys it. And when, when, if I buy a company, I would not only buy its assets, but I will also become responsible to pay for its liabilities. So what I'm trying to say is that when I say perpetual succession, it basically means that we assume that the companies go on. The shareholders, the owners can change, but the companies go. We have a saying that uh, men may come, men may go, but the company goes forever, which means that the corporates, the business entities, they are, they exist regardless of their owners. So this is why, this is what separates, uh, is a very important distinction, that always see the business as decoupled from its owners. They are so much ingrained, the owners and the business, but in, rea in, in, in practice, they are two different concepts, the business owners and the business. The owners can come and go. I invest in some company. Tomorrow I sell my stakes and I, I walk away. You become the new owner. Mm -hmm. So therefore, so the, the point I'm trying to make is that in this pecking order, some may be more advantageous position, like the government is always advantageous because the government want to hedge itself, protect itself, because if all if 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 it is so that the government is number two or number three or number four uh, stakeholder in the packing order, then the state would be having lots of corporate losses, and that would also affect on its finances and you know what we say the public finance. You know, then if the government start having losses of the companies, then the government will not have money for Kela to support people. The government will not be having money to uh, build the roads. So therefore, the government always want to immune itself. So why I call them as residual claimant because they are the one who get some leftovers. If there's some leftover they get, if there is no leftover, then it's their loss. Well, it's their risk, they took it. Nobody forced them to become shareholders. It's their informed decision. So one very important characteristic you can draw from this discussion so far is that, thank you very much for raising this point. Uh, that uh, now we have evidence that among, between the two types of investors, the equity investors are more risk lower than the debt investors. Well, they expect gain, right? They, it, it, there's no guaranteed gain. They expect, yeah. 
if their homework, if their calculations, if their intuition even, uh, if it goes correct, they, they gain, but they may lose also. Hmm? Yeah, losing doesn't mean that they lose everything. I mean, if you buy a share for 10 euros and sell, you sell for eight euros, because you know that the price trend is going downwards, then even, even you get something, but still you lose two euros, don't you? So, yeah. Sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah. And now the government, of course, wants their um, invested money back. Uh, there's a law, or you, you can apply uh, as an entrepreneur for debt uh, re restructuring, which yeah. means that debt investors mm -hmm. get uh, their debt uh, restructured, mm -hmm. and then uh, the business can go on, and also then the government will get their money back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is to keep the system yeah. uh, rolling. Yeah. Um, so, very valid that's point. Kind of the last way out. Yeah, that's very valid, valid point. And uh, but then the stakeholders in this case as well, they don't have anything to say, they're just in the residual mm. things. Exactly, yeah. Whatever is the situation, whatever is the, the government care or the government doesn't care, they are the one who will face the music if things go wrong. But you raised a very valid point, and now it comes to my mind three more phrases and words which I think I should discuss with you. Um, I like this way of teaching when we start discussion and then we have some follow-up discussion, you know, something related. Um, the word is bankruptcy, insolvency, and dissolution. The example you gave, when the company is in a deep crisis, they're, they're, they don't have money to pay, and then the state gave them restructuring of debt. Restructuring could be that they, re, they refinance you, the state finance you, or the state institution finance you, at a subsidized on easy, flexible terms so that you have some, um, how to say, breathing space and you can restructure yourself. Because try to understand when a company becomes bankrupt, uh, it's not just a loss of the company. So many people become unemployed. It can hit the, uh, the lenders, banks also. It can hit the suppliers also, by the way. If I'm supplying resources, to your company, which becomes bankrupt, then I will not get money from you. And if I don't get money from you, this, this is an infection, right? I get, what will happen? I have to cut down my labor force. It's a chain. So we are living in an ecosystem. It's like a, we say the phrase, it's like a, how to say, the ripple effect. So when you throw a stone in the water, the ripples formed. So it's not just one thing, it affects the entire uh, surroundings, basically. Uh, restructuring can happen to insolvent company, but when all these measures, they finally fail, mm -hmm, then we call it that now the company is declared insolvent. Insolvent. And then if finally still nobody is going to buy it, the company is in totally, you know, then we say, hey, you know what? I think now uh, let's dissolve the company. So that we, so if you go to the, its website, it says that the company doesn't exist anymore. Hmm? That is called dissolution. But you're saying restructuring is a kind of, you are trying to give a treatment to an injured patient, a sick person, trying to make it healthy, revive it, but it's possible that it doesn't revive. So then you give up. Hmm? So therefore, um, yeah, good discussion. So we are having these uh, pecking order hypothesis. And this happens for the new ventures also. This happens not only the, the big companies, uh, but now we have uh, different types of investor. But please remember one thing. It's very crucial that you remember. We have so many new words, these, the angel investors, or, you know, we have kind of crowdfunding or the new words, the new types of uh, unorthodox type of funding, but they, they are the hybrid between debt and equity. So in theory, nothing has changed. So the one extreme is that you are fully head on investors, big risk, 
you are the equity investors. The other form is that you are comparatively more protected. And that is debt. And in between, there could be more hybrid type of investments, including these angel investors or these other forms of funding. Okay, make sense? All right. Please tell me one thing. And now I want to test how much you remember what I said. I said some minutes ago that the business is separate from the business men, men, sorry, business persons. I shouldn't sound sexist, mm -hmm. even though men and men, women here are like uh, in the functional sense, not in the personal sense. The business, did I say that the business is not same as the, its owners? Is different, right? Financing, who is getting this money? Is business getting or is it the owner getting? Business getting. Equity money, basically, is business getting from its owners? Isn't? Yeah, the shareholders are the owners. When you invest money, when you invest equity in a company, you're the owner. The question is that, who is getting this money? Is it the business getting or is it the owners getting? Business is getting. Companies getting. Exactly. Companies getting, the business is getting, enterprise is getting. Should it be called business asset or business liability? Hmm? Let's have some more discussion. Should it be called, should, would you like to call it as a business asset because you have money? Or is it a business liability because you have to give it back eventually? No, you're right, but I just want to get some more viewpoints also. Yeah. And let's say if you have some alternative viewpoint, it's very important that we also have the alternative viewpoints a little bit contrary to the theory as well it's strange uh the money is with the company and we call it liability hmm? no i'm just talking to myself i'm thinking loud ivan yeah the of the years that we need to pay them, those are maybe the money that we get from them in the first place, those are assets. So that's the first thing. Just uh, for the last year, in particular for the CEO papers, first I was talking about with the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I believe those are assets. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I got your point, but I, I will not reflect it yet. Yeah. Let's get some more ideas. What do you say? Is a liability or asset of a company? You are very categorical that it's liability, right? And Ivan uh, is giving from some equity investors' point of view. How come it's asset? I want to know. I, I, I've heard from these two gentlemen about liability side, but... How would you do it? You use the assets to, to build your company and build your actions. Say, say, say a bit more specifically, What? how would you build the company? How would you do? Okay, you get the money. You are the CFO. The money comes to you. Okay. So the money is with the bank now. Yeah. You say, hey, overnight, oh, 1 million euros. I'm rich by one. Invested. Exactly. So when you have this money, what would you do? You will invest it. So now please tell me, compare it with the left side of the uh, those words, investing. Money goes to, money goes out. And where money goes to? Money goes to buy assets i borrow uh, money from the bank i borrow from individual investors and then there's some very super brave people 
who became who chose to who chose to become my equity investors and i now have 2 million euros with that 2 million euros what i do i buy i buy maybe building i buy machinery i buy some company assets you know r and d all these things right then it become assets mm -hmm. yeah so therefore when you only see the financing when you only see the financing side technically it's a liability look the money is same right the color of the note is same right but when you get it it's a liability because you have to give it back but when you are utilizing it you are investing it after all when the when you get money from investors it will not remain in your bank account only you're not a bank by the way yeah you have to invest it so this is liability and one again a very uh, simple way of expressing a liability is that what you owe is a liability mm -hmm. and assets are what you can you find some words sounding similar to owe own so only the n changes so liability if you have to say in one word in, in the simplest form liability is what business owes to to insiders like shareholders and the outsiders like suppliers or the banks and so on and so forth and what do you do with that money you invest you buy you do r d you buy building you purchase land you have the infrastructure um you buy some technology including raw material semi-processed goods but in nutshell you own it the business not you well, but the business owns it so what you owe is liability and what you own is the asset mm -hmm. so this is the definition or simple way of expressing now the question is i come back to the original discussion again if a business has to be successful sustainable look when you get the financing you need to pay them right so there's a cost and when you invest you get the return so what should be more what should be more than what if if you are okay let, let me put it this way if your overall cost of financing is five percent mm -hmm, what should be your return on investment at least more than five percent at least six you know so five percent the cost of funding five percent so your return on investment should be larger the gap more welcome sign it is the question is again i come back to this point we never get millions of financing in one day and we never invest millions of dollars in one day but what do we do on daily basis we operate the gap this gap is larger or if this gap is dismal and it's even other way around depends upon among other things among other things it depends upon let's call it operations So a company or a business organization is comprising of three things, financing, investing, and operations. If you have good operations, among other things, I'm, I'm continuously, I'm giving this disclaimer among other things, among because you can be the best controller in the world. You can do all the discipline in the company, but if things, if the external environment is very hostile to you, it, it doesn't work. You can have the world's best controller. You can have the world's best uh, uh, people, accountants, who are very particular about even single cent you spend. But then suddenly there's a tsunami coming on, coming up. There's a big environmental tragedy, or there is a aggression committed by some neighbors, or there is some army coup in the country, and the democratic government is 
toppled uh, or if there is a, suddenly the inflation skyrocket suddenly um, stock market the global stock market crash these things would affect you yeah so all those macro factors macroeconomic macro political all those big factors which are beyond your control beyond your reach i can discipline my company in the best way but i don't have any control on inflation do i no i can make sure that every time my staff go for lunch the electricity is switched off machines are properly oiled and repaired maintained there's no breakdown right but if there is a environmental tragedy what can i do so therefore operations uh, are something uh, which can make sure among other things <laughs> that you are uh, if you have efficient operations we make sure that would ensure that your cost of financing remains below uh, the return on investing so this is the very basic discussion about firm enterprise uh, from the from the financial side financial and the investing side yeah so these are the three points long term investments the long term funding and we make sure that how we maintain our day to day operations in the best way that we stay afloat questions comments all good uh yeah sorry i'm quickly having a glance at the slide so that i know that yeah the first thing is the capital budgeting and we will be studying some part of it in this course in fact all these three parts would be appearing in the slides right so we shall study the uh, the capital budgeting which is the investing side we shall study the financing side and also the operation side and um, yeah the capital budgeting is underlying your first point which is the long term investments i only include the long term investments here because um put it this way if i buy a cleaner to clean the floor of my company that is also an investment isn't it does it make sense because if there's no cleaning you know the company i i would i would uh, harm my assets but then it's a very short term investment so therefore we say that long term investment are the one who bring the real value to the company sustainable value right of course when i clean the floor it will smell good the floor would look nice but this is not something which would generate uh, profits to my organization or which would push my share price up then i have to make some long term investments and i know that some of you have who have taken Uh, manage managerial accounting course of course you guys know because you're doing very on almost on daily basis um do we have any definition of short short period and long period in finance do we have any cut off point that okay this is short period this is long period i'll come back to you a bit there let me see any guesses any fluke <laughs> absolutely absolutely so basically in 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 simple words we have a rule of thumb statement that the the short period is something starting from now up to 364 days but anything which start from 365th day and onwards could be 20 years could be 30 years it's all called as a long period right and usually we call the short period as a current period and the long term period as a non current period mm -hmm. uh, this is where it, we we differ from 
we differ from economics. Uh, if you look at the economics, uh, the, the micro macroeconomics, you will see that they have three periods. In fact, more, they have five periods. The one is very short period. Very short means day, day on day basis. And then they have a short period. Again, there's no limit. This is why I, the finance and economics are different because short period for one company could different from the short period from the other company. So there's no, there's no across the board definition in, in economics. And then we have the long period, uh, sorry, the medium period. The medium period is uh, something intervening period between the short term investments and the very big investments, you know? So for example, you do, you run the company on short term basis, on monthly basis, but before you make a million dollar investment, you want to check that is your company's infrastructure is enough supportive to absorb $1 million investment. That is called medium period, then long period. And then we also call the phrase called very long period. Very long period, <laughs> what is very long period? It's called secular period. Secular period means when, when you are investigating the GDP of Finland for the last 100 years, you are interested in finding that what has been the trend of Finnish GDP for 100 years, 50 years, or before 1917, you know, when, uh, when this Bolshevik revolution came, uh, what was the Finnish GDP before it became an independent country and the post-independent country? So you see the period is super long, isn't it? That is called secular period, period that this study is including. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do in the corporate sector, can you? Because normally the companies are not so long, not so old. I know some companies are even uh, 100 plus year old, but they have gone through so many restructuring, mergers, acquisitions, this, that, whatnot. Yeah. All right. So the capital budgeting ensure that your return on assets. Uh, how you measure it, and if you have a choice of investing, and there are many projects where you can invest in, you make sure that you invest in the best, potentially best project. Look, try to understand. It's something similar to when you go to, when you go for shopping, you have mon money in your pocket, you have wallet, you have your card, card whatever, you know that this is my limit, right? So you know that my, my uh, you know, the credit card, which is a financing, by the way, uh, my limit is 1,000 euros. Um, then you, can you buy everything with 1,000 euros? No, so you pick up something and you find out, you know, ah, this is nice, but maybe it's a bit one size smaller. Okay, this one, the size is fine, but you know what, the color is not, maybe I find some better color or design and so on. So there is a, what you do? Uh, there is an opportunity cost for everything, okay? And eventually what happened? Uh, after sacrificing so many potential products and services, you pick some. Comparable to investing. Not exactly, but comparable to investing. Consumption is technically an investment upon you, not on the company, but upon yourself. Uh, when you become in a position that you are going to decide what type of projects the company should undertake, then there would be uh, dozens of potential investments that you can do. Or there can be numerous ways you can invest in, but you don't have endless finance, so you can't do everything. Rather, you must not do everything. So then what you do, you select the projects on their merit. The merit is called capital budgeting techniques. How we decide that this project is highly meritorious and this project has low merit, this is what we do when we apply the various capital budgeting techniques and formulas. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not very complicated, it's, right? But you apply some techniques and we shall apply these techniques tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> So different techniques you apply to find out uh, that if the project qualifies to be accepted or not. So you have many projects and you are filtering out 
the one which you don't want to take or you must not take and you you keep yourself restricted to those who you uh, you can take in the given uh, situation the second one is the capital structure actually i have given you the meaning of capital structure in this picture who finance you who provides you finance is my question yeah the debt and equity if i say that for this company 40% is debt don't ask me how you decided but that also we shall learn that what on what basis you decide that this should be debt and this should be equity right uh when you talk about these two things that you know what in the given circumstances in the given circumstances uh i think 40% is appropriate debt for my company right and 60% equity is the best but in the past when the interest rates were low maybe uh, debt should be 60 and equity should be 40 you make a rational decision this basically i can talk for hours but basically this decision is called capital structure or we can also call it financial structure just in case or financing structure this is the decision that what should be debt how much debt how much equity okay if it is debt uh, 40% debt all right should it be raised from the individuals like issuing shares certificate type of thing or should we approach some big fat companies like these uh, private investment investors you know the equity investors the private equity or should we approach some financial institutions like uh, banks should i call handels banks or danske's manager and should i negotiate a meeting with him that okay i want to borrow from you how would you provide it you know how much loan you provided so essentially when we have this type of discussion when we when we are debating what to invest what not to invest that underlines capital budgeting mm -hmm. but we need to know that how where the money comes from and in what fraction what proportion is debt what proportion is equity and what is the quality where is the cost uh, then essentially we are talking about capital uh, structure mm -hmm. and i'm i can say with the that we have done a lot of research here in yunk and we have so many publications with my students about this part uh, financial structure what should be that i have some papers about uh, capital structure of uh, finnish companies and how they have a impact on how they are related to the company's performance hmm? right um so this is um I'm not sure if uh, Tiago, can you hear me, or Alexander? Can any of you uh, hear me and confirm that you're watching the screen? Yeah, everything yes. is fine. Okay, at least for me. And the slides? Yeah, are everything working properly? Good, good, good. Okay. And then the third thing uh, we shall study in this course, along with other things. is the working capital management how you make sure that your day to day activities are uh, you are able to perform your day to day activities okay and you are able to pay for your what could be day to day activities from the financial side i'm not talking about the engineering side but i'm thinking from the financial side what could be your day to day activities well you need to buy inventory you pay to supplier and then you need to keep it in your warehouse so you need some building to pay for its to to pay the rent uh maintenance uh, you might be having some guys taking care of your uh 
uh, store. So you pay them salary and then you have the workers in the factory, you pay them salary wages. Uh, you have, do you have enough money to pay salaries to your managers? Okay, and then you have some shipment of some raw material from Germany and it's at the uh, Helsinki port and you need to pay the custom duty to, to get it. Do you have enough cash inflow that you can easily afford the cash outflow, which I just mentioned? Rents, taxes, wages, salaries, repairs, maintenances, uh, custom duties, and so on and so forth. This is this is the operations part. Sorry? Cash in, cash out. Cash inflow, cash outflow. Yeah. So are you able to maintain your working capital? This is called working capital. Working capital basically means that at no point of time, and this concept I discuss in management accounting in details, uh, that your current assets must be more than your current liabilities. The current assets are like those assets which you can convert, which is either cash or cash convertibles. You know, like you have cash, simply bank account, you write it down, a check, it goes. Or you have those assets which are not the hard cash, but you can easily convert it to cash, like uh, bills or securities or the, you know, some investments which you can ask your bank, hey, can you give me loan against it? Those type of things. So, so at any point of time, your current assets should be more than your current liability so that you have some bank account, current, current account positive. And you can also make some arrangement with the bank uh, that the bank provides you. This is a word called credit limit. The credit limit is that at any point of time, if the bank, uh, the limit for you, for your company is let's say 50,000 euros a year, for example. And it has happened that on a given, in a given week or two, there's a lot of cash outflow pressure but your customer is paying you in three months time, mm -hmm. then you should easily approach bank, but just by phone that, you know what, can you transfer some money to us? And then they say, hey, you have a quota of 50,000 euros. Okay, how much you want? Hey, I need, if I get 20,000 euros, I can easily afford my next two weeks. All right, get 20,000 euros and make. This is called capital, uh, sorry, what did I say? Credit limit. The bigger you are, uh, more profitable you are, and older you are, your credit limit keeps increasing. Because all these points are vouching your credibility. So more credible you are, more credit limit you get. And where does the credibility comes from? Uh, it comes from your uh, age, your your how old your company is, uh, how how big you are, yeah, the size of the company because that shows that you've grown over time, and how profitable you are over time. So all these things can help you to manage these things as well. So we shall study in this course working capital management. Maybe these three things we study tomorrow, uh, briefly. Yeah. Uh, please remember that the name of the course is <laughs> Financing New Ventures. So this is not a very specialized course, right? So it's like, I can, I, I won't tell you bits and pieces of everything, which is about uh, finance, yeah? So this is the third point. Um, yeah, the basic issues of working capital management are that, and and this is the, this job is super important. I think in those people who are taking care of the working capital management, they are the most important people in the company, in the finance uh, sector, uh, sorry, in the finance department. And normally uh, these people are not led by uh, CFO. They're led by, in the big companies, they're not led by CFO, they're led by the treasurer, the corporate treasurer. And in the small companies, uh, they're led by the main, the chief accountant, okay? Um, because this guy, try to understand, the problem is not 
that you will have less amount of cash inflow and you have the more amount of cash outflow. That is not a problem. The problem is that there are some time, certain periods, certain bad period, or you can say some challenging period when the cash outflows all of it come together and the cash inflows would mature in month, two months, three months, six months. The timing that you are able to face the cash outflow challenge in a, in a more uh, painless manner, this is a job of treasurer. You see my point? If all your uh, customers are going to pay you in six months time, does it mean that you will not pay wages for six months? No pay taxes, not paying rents, not maintaining your, you know, you have to do it, right? So this is the role of working capital management that you are able to put on the show at least. Right, um, you think we should take a break now? Hmm? Before you, before you all faint listening to me. All right, so <laughs> it's 10 to four. Uh, should we start at about quarter past four? And then we go a bit faster. So let's meet at quarter past four. Um, all right, so what do we do now? Well, I take a pause. Okay, so we continue where we left earlier. And I get, I guess the screen is being shared. Well, that's what I, that's what I at least tried to do it. But okay, I'm sharing the screen, all right. Now, the next slide uh, is basically talking about, uh, it gives you some glimpse of the, the financial markets and the companies and how essentially the network between the firms, the government, and the financial institution could be established. And this figure, this, this exhibit uh, could be a very good indicator about it. And I would explain this entire network between the financial institutions and the corporates with the example of a real life company. And I would, I would be choosing the Finair as a example. Remember the name of your course is New Ventures and Finair is not a new venture, right? But the problem is that uh, it's very hard to get the data of SMEs to substantiate something, unless I get some private information. But then if I get a private information, I can't make it public in the classroom. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a uh, new venture I would assume that Finair is a new venture and how it runs, how it could be, how we can understand this entire network with the example of Finair. And please remember that whether you are a startup or you are a new company or you're an old company, but going for some new projects or a new venture, the underlying philosophy doesn't change. The, the key arguments remain same, right? So the, uh, or in other, in other words, the common sense remains same. Hmm? So am I recording it? I think so. The first point is firm issues, securities to raise cash. Now, please somebody say a bit, bit more about this sentence. Firm issues, securities, to raise cash or raise, fi raise financing. I think raise financing is a better word, but I think they want to sound very rooted, so they use the word cash. Hmm? The firm issue is, issues, <laughs> what is the issue is? The firm issues securities to raise cash or raise financing. What does it mean, basically? Hmm? Yeah. The bank loans, yeah, that's one one form of financing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. That's a good point. Uh, Ivan? I believe shares can be counted as a security stock. Yeah, 
Um, let's see that we have uh, Finnair. How does Finnair, uh, what does Finnair to get the financing? Well, I did nothing. I just went to the cash flow. I just went to the financial statements of Finnair, which I can get in the annual reports of Finnair, right? Uh, at some stage, maybe after I show you this network, I would show you how you can get the, uh, if you want to mimic your existing company with some big established company, then you can easily go and check that what big companies in your industry and sectors are doing. And then you can reflect yourself that where do you position, right? It's more like a comparative analysis. Uh, if you look at this company called Finnair, you will see its cash flow from financing activities. Hmm? And I did nothing else. All I did was I went to the Finnair's because I want to prove the first point that firm issue, issues, what's wrong with my English today? The firm issues securities to raise cash. And how does it raise? It does here, financing activities. Well, what Finnair has been doing, uh, because if you look at this, uh, what is at the top? First of all, these values are in a million euros. And the first table, the first column is 21 and the last column, second column is 2020. So it's a comparative uh, financing. Proceed from loans. Last year, Finnair got 872.8 million euros in the form of loan. And this year, Finnair has got another loan or you know, group of loan up to 396.7 million euros. Loan repayment, uh, last year firm, so you can see the negative sign, right? Negative means money going out. Of course, you, the companies can't always take the loan, they have to give it back as well. So the old loan is re replaced with the new loan, right? So you can see that the Finnair has been paying it and repayment of lease liability. Lease liabilities are basically is also a form of loan, but it's like a usually on, on a long-term basis, very long-term loan. Hmm? Um, interestingly, last year, Finnair raised equity to the tune of 511.7 million euros. This year, Finnair has not raised any new equity. Uh, what could be the reasons that you are, a company is having more loan? Of course, the look, the few things which, look, there is a, the quantitative data tells you very important qualitative information, right? So you need to know, you need to know that what language these numbers are speaking. And then you have to decode it. Look, debt, this much, debt this much. So debt has decreased. Mm -hmm. Debt has decreased. But still they have debt. They have more debt, right? They're raising debt. Share issues. They get some uh, share capital last year. This year, they have got no share capital. So when you compare this with this, when you look at this number previous year and you compare with this number and then you compare this number and then you compare both of them with this number and this blank space, can you make some arguments? Can you build up some statements? We're looking at uh, the firm financing uh, in the context of Finnair. <laughs> You are borrowing some 800 euros and this year you are borrowing only 396 euros, of course, millions. So you think that one reason is that they have a lot of money already. They borrowed a lot. Yeah, so they don't think that they, they don't think that they need to borrow more, right? And here, uh, they don't even think that it's necessary to raise more equity shares. 
if you are a company now if you think don't don't think like cfo uh, of finair think like a cfo of your own company now why would you would still borrow than raising equity and secondly why your borrowing are lower than the last year what could be the possible reasons behind it so my my question is that when you compare i think the question 2 should be question 1 the question 1 is why you have less debt than the last year number 1 number 2 why you still have debt but not equity So they're very cautious. Yeah, and like mm -hmm. putting out equity at uh, this moment is not too wise because the value of the company is not where it. Yeah. Like realistic, it might be when when everything is going. Yeah. Or everything is happening. Yes. Yeah. This this is a fantastic statement, and this is called interpretation. This is how we express the quantities in a qualitative form. in a narrative form in a st st possible story like form that the could be we don't know because we are not in finair but what we can gather the information from the external sources that finair is not in the best of its times or rather it's in one of its worst of times and therefore uh, number 1 uh, finair is borrowing it's unavoidable but it wants to borrow less of than before because more borrowing you have to repay right and secondly as you said that the company's uh, performance is so not so good that raising fresh equity would be actually having a negative market reaction maybe the investors are not willing to uh, buy it because the stock price can go down in the market yeah yes is there uh, well, is there like uh, a limit to the share that the company can issue begin with um yeah yeah even if like right if i'm wrong mm -hmm. like to just cut my head but isn't it that uh, from a limit onwards it becomes the illusion the illusion becomes like a, a, a problem for the company mm -hmm. due to the changing in the ownership of the investors yeah. So you mean that if i correctly understand your question that is any limit up to which the company can raise it's equity yeah, the yes is like, is there a limit? yes when the company is incorporated by the ministry of corporate affairs then in your articles of there is a document called articles of association which you uh, submit with the ministry of company affairs or the corporate affairs or depending upon the ministry in each country right in which you make a disclosure that this is what is our company's starting capital and then you keep it revising over time right uh you can't issue more equity than that if you want to raise more equity more capital then do, number one you have to call a, a agm the annual general meeting and you have to get it proposed by the shareholders voting that they want to have more capital okay and secondly you have to convince the ministry that you are capable of expansion right and you can also even think about that in in a very rare circumstances you can even decide that you know what the government has given us 100 million euros limit but i don't think let's let's scale down and let's keep it to low level you can also reduce the limit as well the maximum limit it's negotiable Yeah. Yes. And one thing also to the situation of Corona 2021, you can see if you go down a few rows, acquisition of own shares, they mm. do some buybacks. Yeah. 21, believing that it's a great invest investment. Yeah. Good. Good point. Good point. The repayment 
is done. Share issue, the, the cost, okay? This is something related cost when you raise, you have to pay to the brokers, underwriters. The hybrid bond, I will only discuss those things which we can make directly connection with, okay? Because we will come back to this statement many times in the future. Uh, acquisitions of own shares, it's very important thing. Acquisition of own shares, let alone, let alone issuing new shares, Finair is actually buying back its own shares. So buying back their own shares also is uh, to show the sh other shareholders uh, or in a hope that the share uh, value will rise. Yeah. yeah. So from such big corporation owned by the government, the Finair is, uh, this is a very small buyback. Yeah, well, it's small, very small, yeah. That's true. But but they just want to show that yeah. it's getting better yeah. and so to raise the value. Yeah, 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 yes and no both. Yeah. Apparently, yes, but it could be no also. If, if they would believe in this, they would make it bigger buy back. Yeah. Uh, those who don't have any background in finance, do you understand this meaning? And when you say this thing and this thing, share issue. And share return, I can say, let's put it this way in simple words. Basically, the company, Fenair, is asking shareholders that, hey, you know what? Forget that we will be issuing more shares. In fact, we want to buy, the, buy back the existing shares. Now, there are two reasons why a company would do. The one is a good reason and the other is a bad reason. <laughs> the good reason is that like, like Apple did uh, for $2 billion buyback. Apple did $2 billion buyback because Apple make a kind of declaration to its investor that, hey guys, you've been so wonderful with us. Uh, when we needed money, more R&D, more innovation, you stood, you stood by us, you, you invested in us. And now we have reached the pinnacles we have of success. We have a lot of money. And I don't think we need more equity because after all, company can't grow unlimitedly, right? And this is the money we want to give you back as a reward. And how they give it? If your market price of share is $40, I, I buy back for $60. And I'm giving you this $20 extra as a reward for your fidelity, a reward for your support, a reward for that you withstood us. So this is a reward for your loyalty to us. You see my point? Is it a positive thing to do? So you are giving them some kind of a reward to your investors of your success. The second is a bad reason. The bad reason is that there is a saying that in politics and in finance, optics can be more important than the substance. Example. Uh, you want to hide your failure or you want to hide your inefficiency. You can do it by buyback. How you do it? Let's say the market value of your equity is 400 last year. This year, the company's worth has actually gone down to 300. Let, let's say 350, because it's like book number 350. The market value of the company's equity was 400 million. Last year, this year it's 350 million. Let's say there were 100 shares last year, you know? So it means that, let's say these are 400 million, okay, 400, let's forget about millions. 400. Uh, euro was the value of the company and 100 were the shares in the market. So technically,
the earnings or the worth of each share was four. This year has been a bad year, but the company wants to give a very positive optic. The company buy back its share out of 120, right? Now, how many shares are left here? 80, because the company asked 20 shareholders that we are going to buy back or acquire your share. We call it acquisition of shares as it's written here, or the more common words are buyback or share repurchase. Share repurchase is a word we use more in the US. Uh, in Europe, we use more buyback. Now you divide 350 by 80, what do you get? Something 375. And imagine that the investor is not reading this part. And this is the column. Which is published in the financial media. Are you cheating technically or not? Hmm? Are you or are you not? This is the last ditch effort to save your skin in the capital market if a company is doing for this purpose. Huh? Yeah, so the optics can be more uh, important sometimes than the substance. The, the, the substance is that company is in a very bad shape. Company has lost 50. I mean, you can say about 12% of its capital value has gone down. But on the, and then here you are giving a very positive sign to the, to the investors. So the, the numbers are very innocent. <laughs> you can twist them the way you want it. Yeah. Okay. So overall, uh, but do you understand this thing? Because this raised very important point that how the in finance, the if the finance is without any discipline, accountability, uh, ethics, rules, regulation, governance, then it will become it will be a chaos. And this is why when the reason I chose to study corporate finance and corporate governance together in my PhD was that. Uh, on the one hand, I want to study that how the companies grow financially, how they become richer, how they, their return on investment should grow. But on the, on the other hand, what about the checks, balances, disclosures, accountability, following rules and so uh, that is part of corporate governance. So this is like a freedom with discipline, you know? So if there's a freedom to grow wealth, then trust me, it will not be uh, it will not be a fair and square because those people who are financially more well off, they would become even richer, and those who are poorer, they would be poor, they would become poorer. And we don't want this type of society. So now the from discussion from corporate goes to the economy and society and things like that. So this governance thing keeps a, put a check on their. Uh, disclosures and their accountability so yeah but otherwise the companies can still do it look if the, the investor is a nine the investor doesn't dig deeper and the investor is seeing only this picture and making a decision like if i'm a naive investor i would see that the company's earnings per share in one year has improved has gone up by nearly uh, 10 percent you know so I make a decision to invest. <laughs> well, when I see the company's value is going down, the question is that um, we we shouldn't trust the company on the face value. So when then we know a little bit of finance, then we start investigating by ourselves a little bit more deeper. But that was not my point to show this picture, show this uh, statement. My idea was that how the com firm, firms, how the how this company called Finair raised its financing. And this come from issue securities to raise cash or financing. Firm invest in assets. 
home, invest in assets. Once you get it, where is this A point here? Yeah, so the firm uh, issues securities. Now the money is with the company and the company is now investing in assets. And assets, as I said, you can buy those different uh, resources. And here we see the investing here. Uh, the company has actually sold its uh, fleets quite, you know, 70. Last year, they sold 300 something fleets. Uh, and this, this year, the 21, they sold 70. So you can see that. No, 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 no. Sorry, I misread it. The sign is what? Negative. When you invest, does money leave you or money comes to you? Leaves you. So its sign is? Negative. So last year, Finnair bought something, some fleet, and the money left the company. That's why the sign is negative, right? 300 plus seven. This is very important that how you read the statement. Uh, so I thought that maybe uh, the investing is going down, but actually it's money going out. Investing is a cash outflow. It's an expense, right? Um, investment in the other fixed assets. It could be buying some land or some buildings for the offices. And then they also have divestment of fleet. They also have sold some of the assets and the money is positive, right? The figure is positive. It means it's a investment, but the money is it's a negative investment. You see the negative investment means you are selling the investment. You invested something, uh, but you sold it. So money is coming to you. Uh, and something else. So overall, um, I don't want to touch all these components unless you see something interesting. Overall, uh, the net cash flow from investing is actually plus. Oof. Now, what does it mean, basically? It means that altogether their disinvestment has been more than their investment because for in for in, in the normal circumstances this figure should be negative you know why a growing company invest so the sign should be negative but if it is positive it means that the company's disinvestments are more than its investments so that is why maybe this is why the company has lesser financing because they don't need it. Look, let alone making investment in the new projects, they are also selling their existing investments. So that could be, so when you see this picture, this figure, uh, cash flow from financing and the cash flow from investing, they're speaking the same language. Cash flow from financing is going down cash flow from investing is rising, it means that there is no need for, there is no scope for extra investments because they are even selling their existing investments. Similarly, uh, let alone new ventures to have new investments, it could be possible that the new ventures are not finding any potential. They, they, stay, they started with a very, uh, very fanfare and then now they find that they have totally misjudged the market and they are not able to find any potential good project the capital budgeting technique shows that no it's not worth investing then at some stage they have to even negotiate with the investor that you know what take the money back we can't fulfill your aspirations make sense what happens in point c uh, point C, can you relate it with point A and point B? Can you? Operations. operations. And operations are the bridge between financing and investing. And cash flow, so the next thing you should see is how much company is performing in the operating sense. And you can see that even though the 
2020 was bad year from operations, so it was negative. This year is also negative, but maybe we were discussing that maybe something is happening with the company's operations or maybe there's some support. There is something going on. Uh, the company's absolute performance is still bad because the sign is negative, but comparatively, the things at the operational level have improved because you made a loss of 1,000 euros in the previous year, but this year the loss is 25 euros. So loss is a loss, but still the loss is 40 times lesser than the last year. And you can see where the things have improved. Uh, can you see where things are getting better? Mm. Yeah. I think there is a change in the trade payables, which means uh, and the financial. This is a big jump. Benefits. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. I think the loss have gone down. Huh? Non -cash transactions. The non-cash transactions, because there's some expenses which are which you don't pay. Can you can you have some expense which you don't pay? Huh? Sorry. Um, no, because. That's the agreed, you pay for it. Yeah, that's true, but the government still have to keep in the records the, the interest, just it's owned by government, doesn't mean that it can write off loans to itself. It's a bit difficult to say yes or no to your query, but what comes very visible is this thing. depreciation and amortization. We we keep, we keep calculate depreciation as an expense in our books, but it's not a, something we pay. Like for example, you bought an asset for 1,000 euros, right? Its working life is 10 years, right? So every year you reduce 10 euro, 100 euros, yeah? But are you paying somebody 100 euros? What you're doing is the 100 euros, this basically means that for each year's profit, you are separating 100 euros and keeping in a bank account so that at the end of 10th year, you are having 1,000 euros again so that you can buy the asset again, assuming that inflation is not so different. You see my point? Or not? So depreciation is basically that you are keeping some money reserved uh, in, 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 in your uh, account so that at, at the end of certain period, you are having more resources. But basically, it's a non-cash payment. It's not something that you pay wages. Okay, I pay you wage. I pay interest. I pay tax. I pay interest. But do I pay depreciation to anybody? I'm basically only uh, moving money from profit to a separate account, basically. But the money is still with me. And why I'm doing it? Because I, when the asset I bought after 10 years, the value, book value would be zero. I want some replacement value of it. So I should be having enough cash by that time so that I can buy something similar again, assuming that inflation is not so different. Mm -hmm. not, not big jump in inflation. Can yeah, stick with the tax support yeah. this yeah so basically it's an expense which you so that is why you see the sign is what plus it's an expense but it doesn't leave the cash it's you show it as expense in your books but basically your cash doesn't leave you and then uh what happens in d now you have financing, then investing, then operations. What do you do next? Cash is paid to the government as taxes and the other stakeholders may receive cash. What do you do then? When you have, when you, when you have your revenue, what do you do with the revenue? You pay, uh-huh, sorry? 
Well, you can reinvest, but <laughs> you have to pay first, Ivan, before you reinvest. Huh? Imagine you are my boss and you earn million of euros. And I say, Ivan, where is my salary? And say, Shab, don't worry, you know, don't worry. Let me reinvest in the business. Hmm? You think I'll be very happy with you? Hmm? Should I be happy? No. Hmm? Imagine you are in you are investing in hundred and hundred of millions of euros projects, and you're saying, Shab, why are you so greedy? Why are you worried about your salary? You know, just have nirvana. Go to Himalayas. Yeah. Do some meditation there. Mm -hmm. Wait a sec. I, Ivan, you have raised very controversial point here. Uh, the firm pay to the government, the firm pay to its stakeholders. And how does Finnair do it? Well, the Finnair also do it. Um, Finnair is paying to its st stakeholders, uh, staff, crew members. Uh, Finnair buys, pays to its suppliers, like those who provided fuel, capacity, and material overhaul, whatever. Uh, Finnair is paying its traffic charges. And Finnair is also paying to the state. The Finnair is paying to the state in the form of taxes. The firm, the Finnair pays taxes. Mm -hmm. So you, the state is paying, but in this case, uh, I think I chose a bad example. Uh, the thing's a little bit tricky, but in theory, you see my point? Finnair would pay its salaries. Finnair would pay to taxes, interest, whatever cost. Look, the Finnair is also paying it the interest. Look at this. Financial expenses. Ah, Finnair has paid 117.8 million euros to its lenders. So it's paying. The sign is negative. But here is the thing. Why Finnair is paying to state, but the sign is positive. Mm -hmm. Has it ever happened that you, because sign negative means that money leaves you, okay? You went to the shop, you bought some pulla and you gave two euros and the money leaves you. And then you go to some clothing shop and you, you let's say you buy a shirt and the, the shop is not only giving you the shirt, but also giving you money. Okay, take the shirt, but take five euros. Like negative price. Hmm? What could be the reason? Here, when it comes to tax, the sign should be negative. Look, they pay salary. The sign is negative because money leaves, common sense. They pay traffic charges at different uh, airports. Okay, the money leaves, sign negative, com makes sense. But why not here? Why sign is not negative here? Income tax. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Sorry? For this year, do it the next year. Uh, this, this is something what, what this gentleman raised uh, at some point. Sorry, what's your name? And, yeah. So this is something which this point was raised that when the company is tr in trouble in the financial mess, then some restructuring is organized. And the restructuring could also mean that you are given some waiver or postponement of some payments wherever possible. State of Finland can never say Finnair, don't pay salaries. But state of Finland can say to Finnair, hey, you can stop paying me taxes. Uh, until you are on your own, you you restructure yourself. You are back on your footings. 
you are struggling, uh, I can make your life easy by not charging taxes. Or instead, I would rather refund the tax to you. In many states, in many countries, it happens that when a company is having loss, it can recover last six years tax paid to the state if it is making consistent losses. So if you have paid uh, six profitable years tax to the state, you can get the reimbursement of tax if you are making loss. Because the rule is very simple. When you, when you are profitable, you pay. When you are loss making, you get. It's like a tax subsidy, you can say. So instead of you paying to the state, the state is paying you. Which makes sense because this is a very, uh, this is a phase which is a difficult phase for Finnair. I think uh, uh, we are more discussing Finnair rather than the concepts, but this, this just came up with the data. Uh, in the good times, uh, Finnair has paid a lot of taxes to the state, and now Finnair is in the bad time, so it's time to be good friends and, you know, to take the responsibility. So the state is paying to the Finnair in the form, but this will never be endless. This will never be forever. You're right. One reason is that the state itself is the biggest investor. That's one reason, maybe. If it was totally a private company, exclusive, like a typical American company, then it, this will not happen. This, well, this would happen. This would happen. Some, some amount the company has paid in the last six years tax, it would be reimbursed, but not all the money would be reimbursed. Not so generously, but you're right, because Fenair is a state-owned company, largely. Therefore, state is playing more role to it. So basically, the state is restructuring its own department, in other words. Uh, the same thing, the same thing happens with VAT. Uh, if you're in a business where you don't add uh, VAT to your services, mm -hmm. you have tax-free uh, corporations. Um, but you do investments and you pay the VAT, then government pays, pays you back. Pays you back, yeah. VAT. So you have a plus sign on your uh, income taxes. Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, another thing which uh, Finnair can do is that it can put uh, a moratorium on debt, which means that the Finnair doesn't have to pay uh, interest and uh, doesn't have to return the loan for certain years. And then the banks can ask, that, what is our fault? <laughs> you know. And then the state of Finland can pay on behalf of uh, Finnair or make some arrangement with the banks that can you, uh, can you wait for two years before it pays? Well, they say, all right, uh, uh, but after two years, pay our interest due, but also pay us the, we use a phrase called uh, penalty interest rate, or we call it penal interest rate, which means like a payment interest on top of interest. Yeah. C is done, D is done, reinvest cash flow. Back to business. Now, uh, now it's your point that since you have paid uh, in a normal situation, when you have a positive profit, uh, then what you do, you invest a certain portion of your profits back to the business. It's called recapitalizing. You're reinvesting into the capital. Okay. It means that because usually uh, when you have the profits and it's not a... Um, not thin air situation, but a positive, uh, uh, you know, the positive profit, then out of the profits, you pay a tax, corporate tax. And this is the profit before tax, uh, PBT. And then you, uh, sorry, no, this is a profit. Uh, no, no, it's profit after tax. This is profit before tax. And this is profit after tax. This thousand dollars belong to whom? Shareholders. shareholders, straight away. But does it, does the company give all the money to shareholders? No, a, a part of it. Let's say the company decide in, in, in its board meeting that we would pay 60% of the profit 
to the shareholders. So it means uh, the distributed profit is 600 and more appropriately we call the we use the phrase dividends for this yeah and the remaining 400 is called undistributed profits and why we keep the undistributed profit why don't we distribute all the profits to the company to the shareholders to make the investment yeah of course if you uh, the positive thing is that if the company has good prospects in the future, you can expand. Or the negative reason could be that if the company is in trouble, you have saved, you have accumulated a lot of money over the time uh, as undistributed profits, and you can meet the challenge, uh, you know, in a more streamlined manner. You don't have to be worried. Uh, reinvest, and what is that? F is cash is paid out to investors in the form of interest. That we discussed already that the company pay to its investors in the two forms. Uh, those who are debt investors, they get interest. And those who get the, those who are the equity investors, they get dividends. Mm -hmm. Those who are the- huh? like how much you reinvest or just like pay for later. Uh, good, good point. Actually, I would say that when the company is in the initial phase, then this decision is more crucial that what percentage you invest, uh, keep the reserve and how much you distribute. But over the time, I tell you, then it becomes more like a tradition that a company would always keep, invest certain percentage, uh, sorry, the company would always distribute the profits to shareholders, certain percentage of profit, and they would keep the remaining money as a reserves and surpluses. And these reserves and surpluses are not only kept for the good reason, but also as a to meet the future challenges. Uh, if they want to revise the limit, uh, then this decision is taken by, of course, by the board of directors. But then this decision is more, uh, they have taken all, almost the decision that what should they do? But then um, when in the big companies, they organize the annual general meeting where any shareholder can go and cast his or her vote. Uh, then they are uh, making a proposal that, hey, shareholders, we are proposing to, for the next five years, we are proposing that up till now, we were distributing 30% of the profits Right, and 70% we are keeping as reserves. But you know what? Uh, we have observed or we have analyzed that it's a high time that we make big investments in Asia. Or it's a high time that we make some new, we buy some, make some alliance with some African airlines. So we might need more money. And we don't want to put any pressure by borrowing more because when you borrow, you are under pressure to repay. And the time is not good for raising new equity. But the good news is that we are having good uh, profitable company. So we are now planning to reduce uh, the distributed profit from 30% to 20%. So that for the next five years, we are able to meet our uh, you know, expansion needs. Hmm? So you have to serve that. This is where the corporate communication becomes very important. How you communi communicate. This one student of mine, she is writing a thesis on corporate communication through numbers. That how there are different ways to talk to your stakeholders. The numbers are same, but how you make the interpretation in different contexts. With the same number, you talk different things with the shareholders. With the same number, you are talking different things with the trade union leaders. And with the same numbers, you're talking differently with the government to get some tax exemptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I have a question for you. Imagine. You are my equity investors. 
and I'm running good show. The company is really doing well. And I'm giving you profits. Everything is normal. I'm running good show. I get good profits. And every year I'm distributing profits with you. I mean, 30%, 40%, that's a different thing. Is that the only thing you get from the company? Is that the only thing you get from the company? As an equity investor. Look, with the debt investors, the, the things are very uh, black and white. I lend you money. You use my money. You pay me interest rate. And at the end of the period, you give the money back to me. Thanks. Simple. It's like plain vanilla relationship. But what about the equity investor? The one form, simple form, is that your company is making profits and uh, multiply by the amount of shares, number of shares I have. You give me profit per share, dividend per share. I get it. All good. What else I can earn from by investing in your company? Hmm? Hmm? What, can you explain to the... You bought some share and it might grow even more. Mm -hmm. and if, for example, it bought, you bought it like for the price of 40 euros. Mm -hmm. And after two years, it's 60 euros, so you have a gain of 20 euros. Yeah, so I can sell in the market. But when he sell for 60 euros, the 40 euros uh, share, he sold it for 60 euros. I didn't give him 60. Market gave him, because this is my reputation grown in the market. The stock price is going up. So... Maybe you are so desperate to buy my company's shares. And then he sells and you buy. For him, 60 euro is good. But for you, 60 euro is very low price because hey, you know what? This company has more growth features. Of course, our decisions can come totally opposite. I mean, the price can go up, the Neil can repent. The price can go down, you can repent. Mm -hmm. What else? What other way you can earn money from the equity investment? And by the way, uh, the first word I used was the dividend, the share of profits, and this is called capital gain. So you bought the share for 40 euros, you sold for 60, the 20 euros is the capital gain. What else you can earn from? Hmm? How about share repurchase? Or what is the word Finner used? Equity acquisition. Is it possible that the company is buying back from you? Look, the, the, try to understand the situation. When the, com when the market paid him 60 euros, I didn't pay him. I mean the company, I didn't pay him. But it could be a situation when the company decides, you know, the, the good reason or the bad reason, whatever, that, hey guys, uh, I make an offer to you. Uh, I want to repurchase the shares and the, you bought from me for 40 euros. The market price is 60 euros, but I give you 70, give it to me. So I give you 10 euros extra that don't sell to anybody else, but sell to me. Then this could be, uh, you know, you can say acquisition of shares or the share repurchase or buyback of shares. Hmm? Which is also additional capital gain. Mm, yeah. Mm. And there's a history behind it. The history is that um, the history is that, you know what, there is always a, a cat and mouse type of uh, uh, game between the regulators and the smart guys in the market. They don't violate the rule. Look, I will not say there is, I didn't say there's a cat and mouse race between the regulators and the offenders. Offending is something that you break the law, you'll be caught. The smart guys, the smart girls are those, <laughs> they, they are those who just make use of the existing regulation to twist and turn in a way that they actually become the beneficiary. Of it. Richard Nixon made a law that companies cannot pay beyond a certain percentage dividend to the shareholders. 
reason, that was a time, I think I'm talking about mid, mid 70s, yeah. Uh, American economy became very inflationary. And one way of cutting inflation is to cut the cost. Hmm? Cut down your cost. And by the way, uh, when you pay profit, out of profit, uh, dividend, that's in a way is a cost to the company. And uh, they, the companies were told that you can't pay endless amount of profits to the shareholders. And as a result, the companies put a cap that there is, they can't pay more than a certain percentage profit to the shareholders. Shareholders were very angry. They were even threatening that they would sell the stakes. The share market in New York Stock Exchange will go down and they would rather buy European. They will go to cross Atlantic and buy the European company shares. The state didn't care much, or the state didn't understand what it means, or it may mean. And then they developed this method of, and the companies were, you see, if you are my shareholders and I'm the company, and the state is making a decision upon me that I should do this way, if my decision, if, if state is forcing me to do something and I do it, I would be the one who lose, not the state, it will touch state, but much later. But I, the company, will be the first one to burn my fingers. I don't want that situation to happen in the first place. So what I did, or what the companies did, they developed this new mechanism of rewarding shareholders called share repurchase. So you don't give them more dividend, <laughs> but you buy back share expensive. You didn't break the law and you, the shareholders didn't leave the company. Mm -hmm. so is it always the case that the shares buy back happens to the higher price in the market? Usually, do you pay the premium. Otherwise, why? what is the guarantee that I would sell share to you? If you pay me the premium on top, uh, then I would sell it to you. Mm -hmm. So does it make sense? Is it making you more confused? <laughs> okay, so um, yeah. Why the shares back? Why mm -hmm. the price? Do they give them back at some point at lower price to the shareholders? Or... Well, well, they can. Yeah, they can in the future, yeah. They can. The shareholders lose. Uh, the shareholders lose in, in what way? Uh, if they buy back from the shareholders, the company. So for, for example, now, um, there's a problem to keep the workforce in companies. So what companies do, which are publicly listed is is that um, they, I don't know if this is answering your question, but in a sense, what companies do is that um, they issue shares um, to be sold to their employees um, mm -hmm. for a price, let's say, five euro share. Mm -hmm. And the expectation is that um, the share price will increase. Everybody mm -hmm. believes in that. And as you are somebody working in a company, um, you work hard as well, and you are buying the company. It is like a good lever, bad lever contract. Like, if you leave the company within two years, you will lose your share, or you need to sell them back, for example. Or there might be other rules for that. But you can, you can, you can keep your, uh, your um, employees working there uh, when you sell uh, cheap to them, and then you buy back. So it's kind of an investment in workforce at the same time, but also. As the share price rises, mm -hmm. it's still the market price. So when you're buying back, you're actually not losing money. Yeah. Because it's the it's the it's the market price you're buying back. That you're, you know, so it's kind of a usually when you're binding uh people to companies, you're doing this uh, bad mm -hmm. lever, good lever contracts. You're yeah. uh, uh you're a good or a bad one. I don't know, how did you call it? cat cat and mouse? Yeah, cat and mouse syndrome. <laughs> Yeah. This is one example. There's many different ways. Of doing yeah, and this is also something similar to what gentleman Butch Henry said is is ESOP. 
Have you heard it? ESOP? It's something, uh, I don't know what P stands. Uh, Daniel, can you check it for me? It's employees stock option. Huh? Stock ownership plan. Okay, employee stock ownership plan. Huh? Option plan, yeah. So here, uh, what can happen is that, for example, let me dramatize a little bit more. <laughs> uh, let's say at the company, I'm heading a company, which is the public sector, state-owned company, very people don't care about, you know, who cares? Nobody's losing. And I'm told that, Shab, next year, you have to give a, state is telling me, the CEO, that if, in two years time, the company doesn't become profitable and the company's value doesn't rise in the market, you'll be sacked. To make this sacking not happen, make any deal with the, with the company, within the company, with the, with the trade union, whatever, yeah? And then imagine that you are the main five, six, seven people who are leading the trade union and I want to make an agreement with you. I say, let's have a meeting today and you all come. So after coffee and cake and maybe after a couple of glasses of wine, uh, we start discussing the serious things. And I tell that, you know what? Convince your staff. You are heading, you're leading different departments. Convince your staff that from now on, Whatever is their salary, they will not get 100% in cash. They will get 70% cash. Thirty percent companies' shares. So if, if your salary, monthly salary is 2,000 euros, you would get 1,400 euros, but 600 euros you will get in the form of uh, Shares. I guess like it's also the broad experience when companies face on bonuses in the form of their shares. Yeah, I but guess. I'm I'm trying to make it in this uh, oh, yeah. in yeah. A, in a very distress situation. Yeah. Companies do it in the happy situation also, but I'm being I'm trying to convince it in the bad situation. What would you do when you hear this news? And I say, hey, there's no choice, no no discussion, no debate. This is the reality. The question is, now what would you do this thing to happen? First of all, your cash in hand is gone down, okay? Uh, you will get more shares now. Would you like the shares value go, go up or down? Because the, the option is that the shares which you have, you can't sell in the market uh, for one year. So the share, 30%, salary in the form of shares, which you get in January, you can't sell it for next January. The salary, which you get 30% in the form of uh, shares in February, you can't sell it before next February. So I put some strict restrictions on selling this share. It means that, that I, I want to buy time from you for one year mm -hmm. before you could sell these shares. What would you do this one year? That, that your interests are secure and my job is secure. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> huh? What would you do? Well, what should you do basically? Hmm? Work hard. Work hard. Which, if you work hard, what will happen? Probably the shares will rise. That's at the very late, later stage. I mean, the stock market doesn't increase uh, Yvonne if, if, the, if the investor come to know that Yvonne is very hardworking. Hmm? From, yeah. So if you work hard, the company's profits will increase. When the company's profits increase, what will happen to its stock prices? You will sell it for high price. So on the one hand, I'm able to encourage discipline in the company that there's a work hard culture, <laughs> less wastage, you know, all the financial discipline. And on the other hand, because uh, investors 
they take the accounting profit very seriously and as a result the stock price can go up and then these shares which you have been getting in the salary of january february march april may you know a lot of shares sell them in the market and make money so you are not only getting self reward from the company but you're also getting reward from the market in theory you know if there are of course there are many other limitations as well if you are a private company and you want to give the same reward then your more rising profit growing revenue falling cost more profit can encourage a private investor to buy your company at a premium mm -hmm. Well, they can, of course, sure. That's a different thing. But uh, but see what? See what? Why it's so that in the USA, the average salary of a CEO of mid cap company is something about $25 million a year, and 90% sometimes is paid in the form of shares, not in the form of cash, and they don't go to court. Imagine you earn 2,000 euros in this example a month, and you are getting 30% of your pay in the form of stocks, and Ivan is considering that they should go to the court, but there's one guy, in the company, the CEO, his salary in the same company is 25 million euros a year. And out of this, 95% or 90% is given in the form of shares. He is not going to quote. Yeah, definitely, for sure. That is for sure. That's for sure, yeah. But look, if you see the CEO, uh, isn't so that he has more to lose? Uh, no. Yeah, 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 he has more to lose always, yes. Yeah, he has more to lose. Yeah. yeah. Because the CEO has much more impact on the company stock prices, their performance than regular workers. No, no, no. Look, <laughs> I just created the example of this okay i don't take it too seriously but I, what i'm trying to say is that can it happen in a situation i know you can go to court i know that's fine but imagine that you can't go to court then imagine there's no other choice you either leave, live with the company or leave the company if, if it doesn't uh, if you don't accept this condition what will you do the, do then and if there's no alternative job available, then you say, all right, fine, let's see. At least I'm getting 70% of cash. I'm not fully unemployed. And by the way, the company is giving you shares. So don't forget that it's not, a, it's not something non-existent. They are giving you, they're making you owner of the company. You are becoming shareholder of the company. Then your natural alignment, when you see a situation, I, in my example, if you heard, I said that imagine it's a typical, typical public sector undertaking where you can come at 11 o'clock and leave at two o'clock and you can have two hours long lunch break. Nobody cares. And we have to create this discipline in the company, accountability. We want to align the interest. Why company, why people sometimes become lazy skyvers and they don't care about the company because they know that no matter what happened to the company, the job is safe and secure. We need to drag them out from the comfort zone and make them hardworking people. Not that they are not talented, not that they uh, can't work hard because the environment is so that they don't want to work hard because it doesn't make any difference. You work hard, you get same salary. You don't work hard, you get same salary. So how can we encourage people to work hard? Well, then, then drag them out of the comfort zone. I'm not propagating that this should happen. All I'm saying is that, can it be done in the form of a line? The basic idea of company paying you salary in cash is to align your personal interest with that of company's interest. If share price go up, 
company become rich, you become rich. The share price go down, company goes down, well, you also go down. It's like winning together, losing together. Not that, that you love the company but, or the company loves you, but the interest is created in a way that your, your destiny is tied together. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And you're saying something, Daniel. You are going to give some example about the bonuses, yeah? yeah, yeah. Like but the bonuses can also be in the form of uh, like stock. In yeah like in case of british petroleum it's very interesting situation i just i remember for the british petroleum the ceo salary when i saw this last time this example it was about uh, something about 40 million dollars a year and they have very simple way of doing. They say that, you know what, Mr. CEO or Ms. CEO will give you certain bonuses, some X amount of bonuses. Let's make a list of the close competitors of BP. Shell, Exxon, uh, Total, and maybe, uh, maybe Statoil, Norway some more companies if you are number one in the league we give you 100 percent promised bonuses so out of six top teams top companies if you are number one in those uh, kpis the key performance indicators you get 100 percent promised bonus if you are number two you get 70 percent if you get number three you get 35%. If you get number four, no bonuses. Maybe in the break, I'll find it out, this example for you, that when the company is told, the CEO is told very clearly that this is how we'll pay you the performance-based bonuses. The idea is to align the interest of the CEO to with the company, that there's no, there's no discrepancy between the interest but then the question is, what can lead the interest of the company deviate from that of its executives? Hmm? What can lead this? Why you have to buy this loyalty or fidelity, why you have to buy this kind of commitment? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Hmm? Think about it. Okay, I'm, I'm giving one small example. You own a small shop, small enterprise, right? Let's say that you are making some, you're processing some food at home, uh, you are packing it, you bring some raw material, you have some kitchen, big kitchen in the house, you make some food, uh, you have, you put them in the tiffin and then you are sell, selling it. It's a small enterprise. You are the one who own this apartment where you have this uh, kitchen. Uh, number two, uh, you are the one who have invested all the money because it's a small scale business. Uh, you don't have to raise any equity capital for this. So it's all your own money. Uh, number three, you don't hire any manager. You are the manager as well. Mm -hmm. So you are the owner and you are the manager. But when the companies become bigger and more complex, then the gap between the ownership and the control becomes, the gap widens. And now compare this company with a multinational company. Uh, okay, I keep in the same sector, let's say McDonald's. Now you started this food packing business in the kitchen and now your company has become McDonald's. When you are a small company making this kitchen, at, uh, this uh, food at home, home kitchen and packing and selling it, 
Uh, you are the CEO and you were the investor. Does it still hold when you become the when it when your business become as big as McDonald's? Now you have to have a separate owner, a separate controller or controller or manager. And the owner is not one, the owners are scattered all over the world now. Shareholders, I mean. In that case, you have to create some mechanism that there is no uh, conflict of, there's no clash of interest. There's no uh, interest of the controller or the manager uh, taking over the interest of the company or harming the interest of them. So in that case, the one form of creating this loyalty between them or alignment between them uh, is the pay package you design. And then you give some fixed pay, of course, but then you also may give some, uh, what do you call it, performance-based pay as well. So that you, hmm? okay. Any questions so far? Any point of discussion you think you want to? If, if I use some difficult word, you want me to explain it to you or something? No? I could ask one thing before I ask for guests. Um, I'm sorry, but that, it says, in the, can I ask you now or do you want to talk about later? No, you can ask me now. Sure. In the assessment criteria, it says, in the word file, it should include introduction analysis and findings for each task. Now, today we're going through this material, and in the end, there's the task we read. Mm -hmm. And it says um, that we should select three publicly listed companies uh, and uh, find out their financial structure. Mm -hmm. Now, should we, should we build an introduction analysis and findings for all of these three different companies, or should we? Combined mm. introduct these companies to yeah. the analyze for them, or how do you want to? I think the the analysis you can do separately mm -hmm. because each company's structure would would be different. Sure. But when you draw some arguments, the core arguments which you draw, that you can synthesize in the common conclusion. And how long analyzes it? Do you want one page for? <laughs> okay, I think we'll discuss that a bit later. Yeah. Okay, all right. So the source of financing. Uh, when do we have next break? We have time till eight. You want a break? Now yeah. or later? Hmm? In 20 minutes. I'll give you a break at six o'clock. Yeah. And then we resume at 6.20 and then we continue till the end. All right. So we start this so our uh, topic source of financing now of course we have discussed many things before already uh, but let's carry on and i will remember that if i have done some concept before i will not touch it again so that we don't repeat things the first form of financing for a uh, for any company for that matter and for, and new and the new ventures are not exception to it is the equity financing and I have explained the meaning of equity financing, right? Uh, that you are taking more risk being part of the company. So you don't keep an arm's length distance from the company, but you become part of it, okay? The equity stake can be in the form of membership. That is the shares you have. Uh, the only difference is that you can have the common shares or you can have the preferred share. I think this word you haven't heard before, yeah? The common share is very, plain relationship, um, you invest your money, the company take away all the cost, taxes, everything, and whatever is left over, you get the part of the profit. The preferred capital is in which you have a certain category of shares. Let's, say call, let's call them A category of shares. So you have two category of shares, the A category and the B category. The B category of shares, shareholders are those people who would get the profit which is left over, the ordinary shareholders, we call them. But we also have an A category of shareholders. They would stand ahead of 
the B category share owners in the queue when the company is distributing them profits. You see my point? Imagine I'm the company and I'm distributing profits and I asked you guys, you're my shareholders and I asked you guys, guys come, let's distribute the profits, okay? And let's say um, you guys make a huddle, okay? Shab, we are your shareholders, so distribute the profit. And then you four guys come and then you just nudge them, <laughs> not too, too hard. <laughs> and you come in front of me. You know, you cross them, you break the queue, and you come in front of me. And I say, hey, what? And you say, Shab, we are not the ordinary shareholders. We are the preferred shareholders. We have preference that we will be standing first in the queue when you distribute the profits. And I give it to you first, and then I give it to them if there's leftover. Do they have a reason to complain? Yes or no? Would you guys complain or would you be too nice? Signed up. Yes, you signed up for it. But the question is, what has been signed up? They are the common shareholders. You are the preferred shareholders, right? You get the preference that you will be standing in the queue first when I give profits. But what you give up in turn, what you give up in return is that you have no voting rights when there is a decision making. So you, don't, you have no voting rights. So your shares are called non-controlling shares. Non-controlling means you can't vote. So you can't control the executives, basically. They people, they stand, like in the queue, they should stand, uh, but they have the voting rights. B category shareholders, they are, they are behind you people when I distribute profits, but in turn, they have a right to vote. You have first right to collect profit from me, but you can't vote, simple. So your share owner, your shares are somewhat hybrid between equity and debt but they are the pure shareholders, right? So we can have some variations of uh, shareholders based on some categories. Yes? Can I ask you, because in uh, financial reports, they always write not the preferred shares, they also write treasury shares. That doesn't mean like the same. Treasury means that when I, uh, they, their shares, which I, uh, treasury shares, uh, first of all, are those shareholders which The shares they own mm -hmm, were once taken away by the company from some other ordinary shareholders, right? Mm -hmm. And when those shares are lying in the treasury, afterwards I give it to them. But I tell you something, I think the mostly the word controlling and non-controlling is used. Controlling and non-controlling, yeah. Controlling means they are the ordinary shareholders, they are controlling shareholders. They are the preferred capital, uh, preferred shareholders, and they're the non-controlling shareholders. Mm -hmm. And normally, the non-controlling shareholders are a very small fraction. In this example, you're almost 50-50, right? But in the reality, you will be a very small minority in the total capital. And it could be possible that in some companies, you your category doesn't exist at all. The company. Yeah, the board of directors. I'll tell you why. You remember that we discussed today in the beginning that you have two extreme categories of equity investors and the debt investors. You approach me, the company, right? And you are not the individual. You can be a big multinational banker by yourself. You can be representing Nordea, uh, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, these type of big banks, you approach me and you say, Shab, we want to become your, we want to convert a debt to equity. Can you do it? And I say, yes. You want to do it straight away or you want to have transition, transitional conversion. And you agree that, okay, 
we want to become a little bit hybrid shareholder first before we become full-fledged shareholders. And then I say, all right, now you convert your debt first to preferred shareholders, which means you get, because now it's your first experience to become shareholder owner of my company. I give you preference in giving profits, right? But for the time being, you don't have the controlling rights. When you stay with me for two years, three years, four years, we renegotiate and I ask you, are you still interested in becoming remaining share owners, full-fledged share owners? And if you say yes, okay, move on. If not, then stay where you are or you can go back and become again lender. Mm -hmm. So all type of uh, possibilities exist. Yeah, so the packing order that we discussed, I will not go into it. And then the companies can also have their personal savings as well. Uh, the companies, the small companies particularly, or the big companies who have the accumulated savings over time. Remember I told you that the profit, or not all the profit is distributed, the undistributed profit accumulates over years, and that becomes company's personal saving, basically. And that money can be used for the reinvestment financing, okay? Uh, for small companies or for some small individuals, you can, even the life insurance policy can be some kind of uh, personal saving, which because it, you can sell it. Uh, for example, the life insurance policy uh, you can borrow against the value. Mm -hmm. The saving can be in the form. When the companies save money, it doesn't mean that all the money has to be in the bank account lying idle, doing nothing. You can, you can buy the saving. You can buy some policies, uh, insurance policies, those policies which you can convert into cash if the need be. And in the process, you can also get some benefits like insurance cover as well. Uh, for example, you can also have the real estate equity loans um, in which, for example, look at the example, the loan is backed by the value of, so the, the example is that if your house is worth 150,000, uh, you can take a mortgage of 60,000, then you still have 90,000 in the equity, which you can sell in the market for cash if you want. So basically, you can save the money in whatever form you want. Mm -hmm. So the personal saving, the company's saving, the personal business saving, you can say in a way. So you can save your money um, and which you can use as a future resource for the company. The third one is the venture capital. Now, I want you to read this slide, uh, and then we have some discussion about it. So please go through this slide, uh, read out some contents, and then we have discussion about it.
Yeah. So yes, the venture capitalist, as we venture capital firms, um, they are generally in the private sector, um, in the private equity companies. Basically, they they have they are more aggressively in the venture capital business. Uh, as you said, some traditional banks can also uh, have this section of venture capital. But I would say that traditional banks, they don't go uh, all out for venture capital finance. They have a lot of restrictions and conditionalities. Well, in a way, they're good, uh, these VCs, uh, because if they're not existing, then some young firms would never be in the business in the first place, okay? But then the flip side is that uh, because the venture capital, they, they can be demanding a lot of money in the form of high stakes. And if they have the high stakes in the, if they are too insistent, it means that uh, they are too interventionist. They can be very highly interventionist. And if you look at these young companies, the idea-based, the growth-based, they're more like something creative, creating some app, uh, creating some form, some design, all right? Uh, even some, some artistic things. And if these people, venture capitalists, are too interventionist, then it may, it may actually jeopardize the creativity per se, or the, the entrepreneur have to tweak with his original idea, and then the idea loses its charm at all, altogether. So then it can be a problematic. So there are some good things associated with it. And of course, uh, there are some bad things associated as well. Uh, usually this is for, um, for the high risk companies where the cash flow is very erratic. I mean, if you approach a uh, venture capitalist and ask, hey, I want to open a retail shop, believe me, they would never give you any money because it's very, very traditional business. So you really have to go for really something upbeat, something really, um, you know, something, something very, you know, high risk venture. High risk means high growth as well. Yeah. So these type of things. All right. So now I think uh, we can take a break. The next category of investors we have called angel investors in another category. Um, these are the businesses which, again, it, it could be in the public sector or it can also be in the hybrid sector where there's a public sector and the private sector partnership and they have the resources which they can give to some potential would-be investors. Um, but here there is a little bit of difference uh, in philosophical terms. Uh, as the venture capitalist, as the name suggests, they are more for the share ownership and they are increasing their wealth. The angel investor, as the first word says, angel. They are like angels. They are a little bit softer. You know, they are more from, they're not from the commercial point of view, but they support you from the developmental point of view. Like in many uh, countries or in many cases, uh, there can be a group of investors. Uh, they have some chamber of commerce or they have some syndicate where they pool some of their resources under even under the label of corporate social responsibility. And they support the small uh, investors, uh, the small entrepreneurs. Their, their Contribution can be financial and the non-financial as well, or both. But they are not very much insistent on the stakes and uh, increasing their wealth. So it's more, more from the, uh, a goodwill gesture or a developmental point of view. Like for example, um, how to say it? Not exact comparison, uh, but for example, we have this organization at the global level called IMF and the World Bank. The difference between the IMF and the World Bank is that the IMF gives loans to countries, but that's more from the commercial purpose. The, they, they see the 
financial and the economic viability. Whereas the loans given by World Bank are more gentle, interest-free, and they even remit uh, some of the loans. They even, uh, what is the word, uh, write off some of the loans. So the, uh, the approach is more developmental. Same way, uh, the angel investors, their approach is more developmental rather than, you know, increasing their own wealth. So they are more supportive. Um, the angel investors may be interested. Yeah, I mean, something like this. I, I know in, uh, I don't know exactly the name in Finland, uh, in, the, in the central uh, Finland, but there are some bodies which are funded by some ministries or state bodies and their job is to create an environment where they can support uh, some would-be investors mm -hmm. yeah you guys often go to these some of these projects like for example we have this talent boost project I, i'm sure there would be some projects meant for the young entrepreneurs as well uh, whereby nobody's claiming their ownership, but they are genuinely being helped, both in financial terms, some seed capital, but also for some giving some expertise, some skilled. Like, for example, um, how to say it? Some few years ago, I was approached by this young lady. She wanted to develop some app, tourism app of Central Finland. But the thing was that this lady was not aware of that how to pitch in financial terms because every time she was going to make some pitching, people were asking more questions about the financial feasibility rather than her artistic skills and those kind of things. So then we created a team of students uh, who supported her. And then she, whenever she was pitching, we were first training her that what should she, she speak or what she shouldn't speak uh, to, 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 to attract the investors. So this type of appro approach that we did could be categorized as angel investors, but not in the financial terms, but in the non-financial terms. So these angel investors are more like angels. They're supportive, they're helping you. So it could be that the angel investors first support the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur, before, before the entrepreneur get full-fledged funding by the venture capitalist. So it could be possible. Uh, debt financing, we discussed. Hmm? I hope you know. Um, you can borrow from the bank, from individuals, and some even non-banking financial institutions and the corporate bodies. What do you mean by non-banking financial institutions? Mm -hmm. um, but then there are corporate bodies. There are corporate bodies also. Uh, yeah, funds, yes. Private individuals are mentioned separately. Non-banking financial institutions could be the, those financial institutions which are not banks, like insurance companies. You can even take loans from, on commercial, the big companies even borrow from insurance companies because they have a lot of in, big amount of insurance policies and they can borrow against those policies, right? Um, it can be the mutual funds or some other funds. Um, it can also be some specialized banks, which are so-called banks, but their job is to give lending for some particular purposes. Like in many countries, we have a body called, or, or, or a category of banks called industrial banks or trading banks. So the industrial banks, they only give loan to the industry purpose. So some specialized, but they are not gen, they're not normal banks. They're not like Nordea type of banks. Well, Nordea can also have its specialized banking section, which is not typical banking. Uh, but the non-banking financial institutions, they are funds, the insurance company, likewise. And the corporate bodies, which means, imagine Nordea, no, 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 Nokia borrows from Finnair, hypothetically. Then Finnair is a corporate body as a lender. You can borrow from a bank, individuals, 
Uh, with the individuals, it happened that if you're a small company, you can approach some selected in, uh, individuals directly. Or if you are a big company, you can approach individuals through the securities, like you issue those uh, shares, same way you can issue those debt as well. Uh, the word for the debt, we use the phrase, we call it corporate bonds or the corporate bills. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you also use the phrase commercial paper, commercial papers. Right. So when the, when the company is borrowing from individuals it, and you borrow from the larger public, public borrowing, it can be in the form of uh, commercial corporate bonds, uh, corporate bills, or it can be commercial papers. Mm -hmm. CP, CB. And the difference between the bill and the bond is that if you're borrowing for the short period, uh, we use the phrase bill, but if you borrow for the long period, then we use the phrase bond, bills and bonds. Bills for the short period, bond for the long period. And as you said, the short period is what? Up to 364 days. So if a company is borrowing from the public, larger public, uh, for the short period, they, then the paper which they would issue, security which they would issue is called commercial paper. But if it is for the long period, then it's for the corporate bond. Ah, yeah, bond, yeah. Uh, you pay interest, you return the principal, uh, you borrow for the multiple purposes. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, the corporate bond is a, is a type of the debt when company issues the debt. Yeah, but it borrowed from the public. Yeah. Against some secure, like it's like a paper, like shares. But the shares don't have life. Yeah. But bill, if the life of the this borrowing is under a year, then it's a bill. If it is a year and more, then it's a bond. Uh, you can borrow in different ways, the different ways to do it, and some even strange ways. Uh, when some financing can be under some scanner, uh, the debt financing can be secured or unsecured. Uh, secured is um, imagine that you want to borrow from me, and I want that I want 100% collateral. I will lend you. I will give you money only if you if my loan is 100% collateral which means that if you borrow 1 million you have to give me a security which is at least 1 million euros or more does it make sense uh, it can be semi secured if you take loan from me for 1 million euros but you give me a security or a collateral uh, or a pledge some assets, some even your house uh, under 1 million euros, then it's partially, you know. Uh, it can be unsecured when there is no uh, security at all, you know. But the problem is that as you move from secure to unsecure, the lender would demand higher rate of interest. You see my point? If you want to borrow in some drugs market or in some um, some <laughs> some strange kind of markets, casino or something, uh, maybe they will not ask you to give any collateral, but then the rate of interest can be very high. On the other hand, you want to borrow from the bank, which is the most highly institutionalized form of lending, then the interest rate would be whatever is a genuine market rate of interest, but you have to give them 100% collateral. Uh, sometimes the loans can be syndicated. Uh, I don't know if you heard this phrase or not before. Uh, syndicated. So basically, you are not borrowing from one bank. Basically, you're borrowing from different banks. Imagine you have a big mega project. Let's say Hippos. Millions of euros investment. And now the, 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 the entrepreneur is approaching a bank. 
why he or she would approach a particular bank because you only know this bank you only have the transaction with this bank and the bank says okay all right we will we are considering your case and then bank without telling the applicant is approaching some other banks or even non banks and then they are making a decision that you know what this is a good proposition it can be very useful for us but the problem is that this this nodi is saying that i'm not capable of giving the whole money to this investor because it's too much and number 2 it's too risky can we banks me nordia danske handels uh, some other banks can we say or even some non banking like insurance company for her law you know some other you know insurance companies let's sit together and let's make a proposal to the applicant that hey we want to give you loan but we want to give you a syndicated loan mm -hmm. so when the amount is big or when the inter when the risk has to be shared then you can even uh, approach for the syndicated loan you can approach a syndicate directly or you can ask your bank and then the bank can decide what should be included what other banks should be included in it but remember that as a borrower your main obligation is toward your uh, to, toward your main you know the the bank you deal with and then that bank takes takes care of the other banks in the syndicate so you can actually you know the banks banks often do uh, for each other you know they help they support short period long period we know um the short term debt is used is usually um, is uh, used to finance your working capital requirements like day on day basis we discussed it long term uh, uh, debt is more for the long term non current type of investments when you want to have some big investments you can't finance your long term investment with the short term financing that's a road to suicide that's road to absolute bankruptcy similarly you can't finance your short term requirement with a long term loan because then the repayment burden would be massive on you so the long term you have to also set the equations that your short term assets your short term requirements like the working capital day on day basis taxes salaries raw material you finance with the short term funding financing and the long term investment requirements you finance with the long term you know financing this can be dangerous the short term funding okay uh, this mistake was done by some countries in 1997 in southeast asia singapore malaysia indonesia hong kong taiwan uh, south korea including by the way and the mistake was that they invited lot of private debt in the countries and with that money this government started using long term projects and largely this money was funded by uh, what's his name george soros have you heard his name do you know him george soros do one thing check him you saw that 